So I'm going to talk about uh, aging, diverse, diversity, and the implications for technology uh, applications. Um, and first I'm going to start, uh, as we were uh, asked to do, by posing some issues and challenges that, uh, as a, it, that's kind of going to frame the context for our panel and also to get you thinking about some issues for the discussion sec session, which will uh, follow after our brief presentations. And then I'm going to focus on um, the increasing diversity of our older adult population and hopefully have time to present some examples of what this might mean in terms of design of technology systems. And if, again, if we have time, look a little bit uh, at the role of technology for family caregivers. Okay. Um, so in terms of questions, um, some things that we're going to be talking about or focusing on um, is given the changing face of aging, uh, what strategies uh, can be we use to minimize digital disparities? And I'm going to show some data later that uh, show, in fact, that digital disparities do, in fact, still exist and really ensure that vulnerable older adult populations have not just access uh, but meaningful access to technology and technology applications that um, meet their needs and enhance their quality of life. Um, we're also uh, concerned about how do we design and implement technology systems so that um, technology applications really help maintain functioning and independence while and without negatively impacting on the performance potential and the social uh, interaction or relationships of individuals. So how do we maintain this fine balance between uh, help, if you will, and harm? Um, we also are concerned, of course, and Rich and a couple other people brought this up um, in terms of what type of applications best support family caregivers and in what capacity. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that this is low-hanging fruit, and, and we agree. And then finally, um, uh, and several people mentioned this earlier this morning, what types of research strategies are optimal for evaluating the efficacy uh, and effectiveness of, this, of technology solutions. I think we have um, quite a long way to go there, and I think that's going to be one of the major topics that we'll be discussing uh, throughout the next couple of days. Okay, so now I want to start and present a picture of the older adult population, and I think it's it's important, um, and I'm putting on my human factors engineering hat now, to have a good understanding of who, in fact, we are designing for. Okay, and I think the underlying theme here uh, is diversity. Mm -hmm. So if we look at who are, who are older adults, um, I think we are seeing some very uh, significant trends. Uh, one trend, of course, is that not only are we seeing an increase in the age 65 plus population, but a very important trend is the increase in the oldest old population. In fact, the number of people who are in their hundreds has gone up 93 percent since 1980. Okay. This has a lot of implications for technology systems. We can't just lump 65-year-olds into one age group, but we have to start thinking about sub-cohorts, if you will, within the older adult population because it has a lot of implications for needs, for abilities, and for capabilities. Um, the older adult population is becoming more ethnically diverse. Uh, again, we can see large increases in the number of minority elderly. Um, and um, the number in, by 2030, there'll be a 155 percent increase uh, in the number of Hispanic elderly, um, 104 percent in the number of African American elderly. Okay. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Bernard and also by Beth, um, living arrangements of older people are also uh, diverse. Um, Many older people, especially older women in the older cohorts, live alone. Um, and many older people live in outside of metropolitan areas, uh, more in rural locations, or I think that number would be even larger if we said suburban locations. 
which has not, uh, many implications for logistics, mobility, transportation issues. Okay. Um, we also have diversity in terms of education, although as a whole, uh, people over the age of 65 are um, getting more advanced in terms of educational attainment. There still is a, a fairly large percentage, about a quarter of older adults, and this is higher if we look at subgroups, uh, people in the older old categories or minorities who only uh, have maintained or attained a high school education. Uh, many older adults uh, have low income, okay, which has lots of implications for what things cost and what can they afford to buy. Um, and something that we've been focusing a lot uh, in our research on CREATE is this whole area of literacy. Uh, and I think it's very important to point out that, uh, and I was a little stunned to see these statistics myself when I was preparing this slide. Even though you know it, you don't really know it until you see the numbers. Um, 26% of older people have below basic prose literacy. And if we add those numbers together for health literacy, only 3% have proficient health literacy. That's uh, some very recent data uh, from the CDC. Uh, health status, I'm not gonna spend time on this, only to point out that people have varying uh, limitations, varying disabilities, varying chronic conditions. Uh, so we're looking at complexities uh, with res uh, in terms of design from that perspective. And these conditions and limitations um, uh, increase, of course, with the older cohorts. And one thing I do want to point out that sometimes is, over is overlooked when we're talking about health is that mental health issues um, are also uh, important when we're looking at older adult populations. And I think about 20% uh, of people over 65 have some kind of me mental health uh, concern like uh, 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 depression or bipolar disorder or, or anxiety. Okay. And then, of course, uh, there's the whole area of cognitive impairments. Okay. So what does this mean uh, for us when we're thinking about designing technology? What are the implications? I think there's lots of implications for what a user's need is and what their preferences are. Okay. When we're talking about diversity and variability, we have to understand that one size does not fit all. And I think we can group and think about needs and preferences in terms of what type of technologies best support or compensate for age-related declines or disabilities, um, what type of technologies best prevent further declines of disabilities, and also um, improve well-being. For example, applications like uh, social networking, educational uh, <coughs> applications, et cetera. Certainly, diversity has vast implications for interface design. Okay. Uh, there are cultural and language issues that need to be think thought about. Um, um, you know, different cultures have different patterns of communication, different beliefs about health, uh, different beliefs about caregiving. Uh, those are not insignificant if we're talking about uh, technology systems to support social networking or family caregivers. Certainly, uh, complexity is a very big issue. Um, the cognitive demands, the literacy demands of technology, what does it cost to adopt technology in terms of cognitive and mental effort? That's a big issue for older adults. Um, many issues around uh, accessibility uh, in terms of, and Vicki will address this more completely, uh, changes in social, we have to compensate for changes in social, sensory and motor functions uh, and for all of the chronic impairments and disabilities that a may, an older person may have. And just for fun, uh, I just wanted to put up a couple of slides to uh, kind of, I don't mean to pick on anyone here, but to pinpoint the importance of this and how it's not often thought of. This is a pair of page, uh, current page from the Medicaid.gov website. It has to do with uh, uh, information about how to get drug coverage. And we just did some quick, very quick reading statistics on this uh, using the flesh Kincaid grade level. And um, this um, is about, 11 and about 11th grade reading level. 
okay, to just understand this web page. And um, I just want to put that in context of the earlier slide I showed you about literacy and people uh, who have low literacy in the over 65 population. Uh, this is also kind of amusing. This is a blood glucose monitor. Um, and this are, is the instructions for what to do if you have high glucose results. Uh, this is written, again, at about the 11th grade level. Okay. And from some of our own research, um, I just, again, want to show you the importance of thinking about this for design. Uh, my student, uh, Jessica Taha, just looked at uh, ab abilities of lower SES older, middle-aged and older adults to use a patient portal to do things like check their lab test results and understand their medication regimens, et cetera. And she found a lot of our sample couldn't perform the task very well, that uh, cogn cognitive abilities, and these were non-cognitively impaired older adults, I, sh I should point that out, and numeracy skills were significant predictors of, of performance, and importantly, there were really a lot of discrepancies between people's own rating of their numeracy and their actual numeracy. People tend to think they have much higher numeracy levels than in fact they do. Okay. Um, and then my colleagues uh, at Columbia, we just finished a study where we looked at a sample of lower SES patients to use three currently available PHRs. And again, we had uh, people had a lot of difficulty uh, using the systems to perform basic health management tasks. Um, they reported lots of usability problems, uh, many of them having to do with the complexity of the language and the design of the system, but they perceived them as potentially useful. Okay, so this is just some example of how we have to think about these issues uh, in terms of um, design and usability, okay? Um, there are also uh, implications of this diversity in, in the older adult population for design of training, instructional support, as well as technical support. How do we best train older adults to use technology? And I think this varies considerably with the characteristics of the person and also the technology that we are training them to use and the context in which the training occurs. Um, how do we design instructional assistance system materials and what, what happens if the system breaks down? I think this is a really important question uh, when we're thinking of older people who live alone and maybe have low um, technology literacy skills. Um, someone else mentioned this morning there are issues around security and privacy, uh, cost and payment, which I'm not going to elaborate on. Um, uh, and lots and lots of I issues around access, okay? Ensuring that people actually have access to systems. And in that respect, I just want to show you some very recent de data. Thanks to Neil for um, helping me get some of the new data on, on these issues. Uh, looking at the trends in internet use um, from 2000 to 2013, and um, the bottom line is the 65 plus population, and although um, the usage has increased over the past decade, we can still see there is a significant age gap, and that is particularly, um, if we broke it down into sub-cohorts, you'd see it was even lower for those uh, 70, 75 and above, okay? So I think access is still an issue, um, and this is looking at the data slightly differently. This is a percentage of people who go online um, actually have broadband at home, um, which has a lot of implications for what kinds of technologies people can actually use and what they can do, do with the technologies they have. And then own a tablet computer, and you can see that it's fairly low for people uh, in the older age cohorts. Now maybe this picture will change uh, as the baby boomers age, but don't forget technology is going to change as well. So it'll be interesting to see um, how these things look with when newer technologies come out. Um, and the other point is, is that there is disparities uh, in terms of education, um, in terms of income, and also in terms of uh, ethnicity um, and minorities. And finally, um, I just want to mention that we do think that 
Technology can play a big role in aiding family caregivers. Um, there has been some work going on in this area. Um, we've done some of it uh, in Miami, and certainly technology can be used to deliver programs and services to caregivers, can foster communication with other caregivers, family members, give them lots of ac access to information about their, patient, the, their loved one's illness, and even caregiving skills and issues. But I think before the promise of technology um, becomes a reality for this population, we still have a lot of work to do um, in terms of trying to understand what technology applications best meet caregiver needs. Um, are these programs and services cost effective? How do we integrate technology with other aspects of the healthcare system in the day-to-day -day lives of the caregiver. And I think um, there certainly is um, need for a lot more rigorous uh, research and evaluation in this space. Thank you. Now turn it over to Wendy. So I'm um, going to talk about technology design for older adults. And this was the question I put on my overview slide earlier, and I just wanted to unpack that a little bit more. How do we go about doing this? We need to think about strategies to match technology support with active engagement. We need to think about this balance between support, augmentation, and replacement. We need to think about developing technologies to both challenge and enhance functional capabilities. And lastly, think about issues of motivation, self-efficacy, technology integration, engagement, safety, privacy, social connectedness. So a lot, of, I'm so excited to already see these themes emerging from what everybody spoke about this morning. So by way of background, I direct the Human Factors and Aging Laboratory. And we put out there as our mission to support independent or successful aging. And we define that as allowing individuals to function effectively and independently as they age, to maintain their personal autonomy, and to both retain and enhance ability to function in later life. And we know that all of these are contributors to healthy aging. So these are good goals to have, but not so easy to accomplish. And so my theme for today is that we need to embrace the complexity of the problem of designing technology for older adults. To not think that it's simple, and I'm not sure anybody does, but I see sometimes in things that are being developed that this bit of technology is going to solve this problem, and they're not thinking about the big picture of the space. So that's the theme of what I want to talk about this morning. And I think we need, need to be all guided by the WHO's International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, where disability is thought of as a continuum, and activity and participation are considered as equal goals. So this is an overview of their model, where you think about the, hopefully I have a pointer, let's see this big thing? Yeah, okay. So the individual might have particular health condition, disorder, or disease that is going to influence body function and structure, their capability to perform certain activities, and their participation in the community. We also need to think, though, about various environmental factors and personal factors that provide the context for the activity or the participation. There's a model in psychology about how individuals respond to the challenges of aging that I think can also provide us with some guidance. So it's called the SOC model, which stands for Selection, Optimization, and Compensation. And the idea is to think about for a given individual, how do they respond? Well, they might choose certain goals and not focus on trying to do everything, or they might have to prune goals simply because they can no longer do everything that they're interested in doing. Another avenue is to try to optimize the resources that they have, so to distribute whatever they have available to maintain the performance level that they're interested in. Or we can think about compensation, which is using new resources such as technology or outsourcing as a way to compensate for loss. And I think that's where most of us here are focusing. 
So let's suppose we're designing a technology that's going to enable individuals to deal with some limitations. Well, that's challenging. So one of the things we've developed in the CREATE group is this model of the human technical system that requires us to think about the whole context. So we have the user who brings to the situation as some of the things that Sarah was pointing out, some of the individual characteristics of the user that result in certain level of capabilities. We have the task that they're trying to accomplish, may be complex, may be familiar, may require lots of coordination of various things. That imposes certain demands. And then we have the technological system itself with its given hardware or software or maybe lack of instructional support. So the technology, the system is also imposing some demands and those all have to match in the, in the center here. But all of that is occurring in a social and physical environment. You have family and friends and healthcare providers and community members and so on. So by thinking about this big picture, it enables us to better design technology that will then work in the context where it will ultimately be used. So what I wanted to do is to just take a few minutes to give some examples from some work we've been doing in the design of robots for older adults. So if you're going to design a robot to support healthy aging, what does it have to do? It has to communicate with the humans in some way, and the human has to be able to communicate with it. It has to perform tasks either for or with the person. It has to be trustworthy. It has to provide social support. It has to have an appearance that people like. So this is a very a multifaceted problem, and the success is going to depend on understanding older adults' capabilities, limitations, needs, preferences, and so on, but also, very importantly, involving the older adults in the development and the testing of whatever technology we're talking about. I'm talking about robots, but the same things would hold for other technologies. So I wanted to illustrate my point with a, a relatively straightforward example. What do people want their personal robots to look like? This is actually a very important question because the, pr the appearance of a robot influences trust, reliance, willingness to use the robot for tasks. So one of my students did her master's thesis on this. And what we did was we showed people different appearances of robots and said, well, okay, you're going to have a robot in your home to do things for you. What do you want it to look like? So this is the audience participation part. Would you choose robot number one, two, three, or four? Call her out. None of the above, some people are saying. <laughs> the younger adults chose robot number three. The older adults chose robot number one. So already there was some difference. We also then showed them human-like faces and said, but this is what your robot looks like. What, what are your preferences here? One, two, three, or four? OK, a lot of consistency on that one. Well, then we had the morphed faces. One, two, three, or four? Little bit of uh, disagreement there. One and two were for the younger and the older adults. Now, where I think it's even more interesting is we said, well, what about for different tasks? So suppose you have a robot that is going to do chores, like clean your home. Would you choose column one, two, or three? <laughs> See how mixed you are. Mo both younger and older adults chose more from column one for that task. Well, what if it's a social task, like chatting or playing a game or helping you learn new things, more like the EADLs we were talking about? What would you choose there? Three. Three, and so did they. And what if it's decision making, like investing your money? What would you choose? Two. There was a mix of two or three. So for these tasks where you expect the robot to have more intelligence, you wanted it to look more human. For a, a task that is more servant-like, they wanted it to look more like a robot. So this is a relatively simple example, but it shows that what people want their robot to look like differs as a function of age, differs in a f as a function of the people in this room, different types of tasks, and this is important because it will influence the interaction. So we need to think about the diversity, going back to Sarah's point, of the humans and their needs and their preferences for design. 
And what we're trying to do is to develop a framework, and I'm going to unpack this in a moment, but a framework for human-robot interaction in the context of healthcare. So Sarah mentioned already a number of different human user characteristics that we need to think about. Additionally important here are things like robot experience and preferences. But then there are all the characteristics of the robot itself. So you can think of this as a team, the human robot acting as a team. Well, the human needs to know various things about the robot's capability, um, how consistent or predictable is the robot action, how reliable is it, and so on. We also, again, need to think about the task, and we developed this in the context of health tasks. So suppose the robot needs to use a device, such as a thermometer or a medication bottle, or suppose there may be some physical discomfort, or the robot has to be in close proximity with the human. All of these things need to be considered in the context of the design. And then lastly is the, the broader context. So you have the care network or the culture that this is occurring in. Is it in the home? Is it in a residential facility? All of these things are going to play a role. And so you have this big network of factors, many of which will be important for any particular human-robot interaction. And so I think my, um, my take home here is to recognize and embrace this complexity, whether we're talking about human technology interaction generally, human computer interaction, human automation interaction, human robot interaction, we need to recognize, and this goes back to some points that were made earlier about the, the technology side and the human side, both being complex. But my last point I want to make is that these may be challenging, but they're solvable. We have a lot of expertise in this room and outside of this room, people who are working in this space. We need to be guided by theory. We need to take a systematic and a comprehensive approach and endeavor to develop these generalizable solutions that aren't bound by the technology we're working with today, but that will still be um, useful for the technologies that will be developed tomorrow and next year and into the future. So a little bit more about what I do and what my team does, you can find at our two websites, and thank you. So I was specifically asked to talk about disability and aging, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background coming from accessibility research. I'm going to ask a few questions, I can only give a couple examples because we were asked to talk for only 12 minutes, and I'm going to make some sweeping generalizations that you can all pick apart if you know the details about things. Okay, so the first question. Um, Computing's made significant advances that allow for ever-increasing amount of information capture and storage about what people are doing in their everyday life. These are the sensors that people have been talking about. But what really makes sense to do with all this computing power? And I'm not going to really talk a lot about privacy, but um, all these sensors do raise a huge privacy issue, and I suspect other people will talk more about this um, in later talks. So computing power has radically improved over the last several years, right? We all know this. Uh, there, there's the progress on wearable sensors. Certainly we have more processing capacity, more network bandwidth, and more storage capabilities. And this is just one illustration of an, an example of how our digital storage capacity has just um, exponentially changed over the years, right? Um, well, you can see, so right now we have the ability to store virtually everything that we could possibly want to store when we've got these, the cloud out there now. And one of the things that people are looking at is life logging, if you've heard about this. And the basic idea behind life logging is to have total recall through total capture of virtually everything that happens in your life. So people who are into life logging will wear the cameras that every 30 seconds takes a picture for you. Um, ideally, you could have um, sound, although sound seems to be a bit more tricky in terms of other people don't like having their conversations captured. But anyway, in, in theory, you could be capturing information about the conversations around you. You could get information about um, the temperature. You could get information about sensors or so your bodily states at various points in time, how excited you were. Um, the question is really how useful and how good is all this. 
people have been looking at this in terms of our ability to augment memory in some sense. So how can it help us uh, recollect things? Um, one thing I would love to be able to do is remember all your names after giving these introductions. If I learned one or two of them, I'd be really proud of it myself. But uh, maybe with something like a life logging thing, I could now walk up to you and it would say, oh, there, that's Clayton Lewis, you know? <laughs> I could sound like I'd done a good job. I, I've known Clayton for 30 years, so I, I get no credit for remembering Clayton. <laughs> okay. Um, Another thing that life logging has talked about as being useful for is reminiscence. So uh, you have all these photos, sounds, memories, digital artifacts from your life, and you could go to some family or friends and share an incident from your life and talk about it and all have happy memories maybe of your wedding, for example. Um, also, um, could look at just reflecting on various life experiences. So look back over the maybe five last years of your life and what were the important things, right? So uh, uh, the potential to give you some kind of evaluation about your life. However, it turns out that the verdict is still out on this. If you look at the kinds of things that happen with life logging, all kinds of stuff gets captured. I mean, everything all the time. Um, and it's not clear what the real benefit is, in part maybe because we don't have a good way of indexing it, right? Um, I put down still hard to access here. So if I want to remember Sarah's talk from five minutes ago, I can probably look that up still because I remember how to find it. But if I want to remember a conversation that I had with Beth, say the last time I met her, it's been a couple years, and so how do I go back and find that time in, in my past when I met her so that I can recall that conversation. So far, it, so people are working on that, but it's not there. Uh, the other thing with life logging is it does capture everything. So we have the storage capacity to capture everything. Is it really worth it? <laughs> my life maybe not is that interesting. Um, but some of the uh, things that they're starting to look at is how this might help with dementia, at least in the short term. So if the, if people have dementia and you're capturing some of the events that go on in their daily lives, maybe this would be something that they could usefully have discussions with their family and friends about for a while. And maybe it e would even improve their memory, um, a form of augmenting memory for a while. There seems to be some evidence that it does help with memories for a short time, maybe not for a long time. As I said, the verdict is still out, but a potential interesting use of this technology. Okay, in terms of disability, uh, we've already had people talk about the fact that with age, you get multiple disabilities. These disabilities also interact. And so how do we provide uh, usable technology interactions for this group of people? Uh, this kind of thing's already been presented, but I loaded my slides before all the talks this morning, so you're gonna have to look at them anyway. Um, in general, one in five people in this country has a disability, but that clearly interacts with age. So in this slide, you can see that um, for like teenagers, only one person, the, the clear person on the right might have a severe disability as a population average, and some other people would have an impairment. But as we go through the decades, you see that more and more people have a disability or an impairment of some sort. One of the issues that's been really emphasized today is diversity. And so I would, I, I guess that's maybe the theme of our session is the word diversity. I'd also like to point out it's dynamic diversity. So that means that an older person may have a disability, but there's good days and there's bad days. So if you're designing technology, it's not a constant, right? So maybe one day the memory is good, the next day the memory is not so good. Um, motor ability in particular is affected a lot by medications that they're taking at one time. So there's no one clear answer. So here we have to look at adaptations in technology to help us. There's a couple things that I think are real problems for people who do accessibility research that I don't think we pay enough attention to. One is that disabilities co-occur with age. There's certainly a tendency to look at people who have vision problems or people who have hearing problems or people with motor disabilities, but not to look at the fact that these things co-occur. And this is what happens with older adults. And the combined effect of disabilities is probably worse than the two uh, 
uh, disabilities, if you took them and tried to add them, it's probably more than additive. If you have trouble um, pointing, for example, because y your hand shakes, if you have trouble like clicking on an iPad, that you're going to miss the target often, but if you also don't see very well, it's going to be very hard to put the right target. Uh, so we have sensory, physical, and cognitive impairment that are all interacting to create problems for our interactions with technology. One of the things that I think is very important, well, for everybody, not just older adults, but is the ability to communicate with other people. A huge problem for older adults is hearing loss, which is very isolating. Suddenly it's hard to participate in conversations with your friends or with other people. But um, hearing loss is not the only thing that leads to communication difficulties. So if you have a vision loss, you may have trouble uh, lip reading. One, maybe one of the little known facts is that even people who hear well do some kind of lip reading at the same time. So you're losing that ability if you've got poor vision. Um, as an older adult, there may be some aphasia that you've got. And imagine if you had, um, say, dyslexia all your life. So suddenly, now the ability to read like captions or something is interfering. So there's all of these things that are just going to exacerbate your problem in trying to communicate as an older adult. Same with independence and mobility, for example. If you have a vision loss, it's hard to get around because you can't see where you're going. The obvious kind of disability for independence is some kind of mobility thing. If you're in a wheelchair or a walker, it's hard. Imagine putting the two together. And think of the fact that um, if also there's potential memory loss. So if you're trying to navigate around and be independent, you may not remember your route very well. So it's hard to let older adults off and just walk around on their own or drive around on their own. And for both, well, in all cases, there's a tendency for older adults to have trouble learning new things. So if we're building new technologies for them, just learning how to use the new gadgets is going to be tough, tougher than for 20-year-olds. One of the other things that happens a lot in accessibility research is that I tend to call this designing for the brightest and the best. Uh, I've heard a lot of papers presented about accessibility over the years, and there's a tendency to study very bright college students who have a vision loss or who have a hearing loss, and systems are designed for that group. But not everybody falls into that category. So uh, as accessibility researchers, we need to get the message that we need to study a much wider range of the population, right? So what about those people who don't have IQs of 130 and 140, right? The other thing that um, accessibility researchers often study is people who have a congenital disability. Well, for the older population, many of the people develop the disability later in life. So they're going to have different abilities, different ways of coping with a disability. And I give an example here that relates to hearing loss. So I probably should have gone back, but um, th there's a lot of work, for example, that goes on uh, communication and sign language. Well, that's fine for younger people who have uh, a hearing loss. It doesn't work so well if you lose your hearing when you're 70 or 80 because you're not going to develop sign language skills, right? Another problem comes up, for example, uh, for older adults with hearing loss in terms of just being able to communicate on the phone. Sarah talked about the di digital divide in terms of using smartphones. We seem to have read the same survey, so came out with the same numbers. Um, but there's also a digital divide in terms of an using analog TTY telecommunications devices, and that's what this is a picture of. So uh, if you haven't seen one of these before, if you have a hearing loss or a speech impairment, you can use the phone by taking your analog phone and placing it down um, on this and typing to someone else. It turns out that the people who use these all the time are much older than the population as a whole. The reason for this is that the younger population now has many ways of using smartphones and other IP communications. So they don't use these analog systems anymore. And these analog systems are going away, but we still need them for older adults. Problem is who wants to support these kinds of older technologies. 
This is the question that I had before, is how do we take advantage of technology without overwhelming use users? Uh, there's been discussion of useful and usable. I'm picking up on Sarah's comments. Uh, technology needs to do something that people want and staying at home may be a tipping point. People really do want to age in place, so they're willing to use something. Uh, Rich Schultz does um, this analysis certainly much better than I do, and maybe he'll talk about this later. But there's um, situations in which maybe that isn't everything. So if you are going to stay at home, but people aren't going to come see you anymore, maybe that's a trade-off you don't want. People don't want technology if it means they're going to be isolated from other people. So we need to look a bit more at the trade-offs with technology. Also in terms of being usable, one of the things that we've been looking at in our work is co-design of technology. So rather than just having the computer scientists come in and say, here's what you get, which is a tendency among computer scientists, I know, um, <laughs> we have um, some designers go out and actually work with older people and say, what could you actually use, and give them all kinds of design suggestions and actually do co-design with them. This is a case where we're looking at indoor navigation in care homes, and we have beacons installed in homes, and the people have to wear mobile phones, and we had all kinds of complaints from them that they didn't want a mobile phone. They didn't want anything that looked like a mobile phone. And we said, you don't have to use the phone features, and they didn't want it at all. So what we ended up with was a sleeve kind of thing that held the fact, or uh, that hid the fact that it was a phone, right? And they just wear this around on their arms. But it was just offensive to be a phone and have to use it. And I think this is one of my last points. Um, things are being constantly updated, and how do older people deal with that? So I mentioned the migration to IP telecommunications, which is going to be hard for people. There's the constant having to deal with the learning and the cost of new versions of software. And again, there's little interest in having developers support back levels of applications, right? So there's a natural tendency between the users wanting to keep what they've got and companies needing to keep bringing out new products. And my last slide, <coughs> the idea here is that in the future, older adults will have more technology experience than the older adults of today. However, the technology is going to change. So every time I talk about this, I have somebody who's in their 20s who stands up and says, well, when I'm 80, I'm not going to have a problem because I'm really good with technology. <laughs> and <laughs> I haven't got people to understand that the, the things they're using today aren't going to be there in 60 years, right? Um, I'd like to see if we could find some generic ways of sort of future-proofing for the future, some general principles on designing for aging rather than having to, every time there's a new generation of something come out, then decide on the spot uh, what we're going to do with it. <laughs>